Welcome to the introductory financial CGE modeling course. In this module, we will learn how to build simple financial CGE models. We will start with very simple models, but add complexity step by step. In doing so, we will use the material developed in the book of de Calloway, Martins and Savard, 2001, to present CGE models such as Auta, Auteta, and Exter. These real models should be very well known by all of you, but we will add the money and financial dimension. The financial CGE modeling course is divided into two modules, monetary and financial. In the monetary module, we will study simple monetary CGE models. In the financial module, we will describe simple financial CGE models. We will start with the monetary module by discussing the advantages and disadvantages of real CGE models like AUTA, AUTETA, and EXTER. At this stage, you might be wondering what I mean by real CGE models. Well, you will become familiar with this concept soon, and you will be learning to distinguish between real and monetary or financial CGE models. We will discuss the differences between the real and financial CGE models. The M Auta model is a monetary model in the sense that only money is added to the real model. For the moment, we will limit our interest to introducing a transaction demand for currency only. We will introduce the new equations and variables and present the calibration procedure. And to conclude, we will present some interesting simulations and discuss the results. What is a real CGE model? What is a monetary or a financial CGE model? We are trying to understand the difference between these types of models. And why are we using a CGE approach? As we know, the CGE approach is a powerful tool that allows us to understand the impact of economic policies and external shocks. This is a useful instrument because the methodology is developed in a coherent way, linking the different components of the economy the production, the income, and the expenditure of agents. The statistical framework is based on the construction of SAM, social accounting matrix, in such a way that any expenditure by an agent needs to have a counterpart received by another agent. In a CGE model, we will be able to compute the GDP in different dimensions. One is the production approach based on the value added of sectors like agriculture, mining, textiles, etc. Another is the income approach. You can see the contribution of labor and capital income to GDP. The third calculates the sum of final demand household consumption, investments, government spending, and net exports. Of course, the three approaches give the same evaluation of the GDP. Even if the perspectives are different, the methodology constrains the analyst to look at the different components of the economic system in a coherent way. When calibrated to a SAM, a real CGE model is able to replicate the flow of income, production, and demand for a given year. And in a shock scenario, the results of a simulation provide not only the change in the flow composition of the GDP, but the change in other variables as well. Some of the other variables are the relative prices of goods and services, the use of factors of production that either increase or decrease employment, and the remuneration of factors of production. This last variable is the rate of return to capital and wage rate, as well as the income and expenditures of the government and the row in an open economy context. The contribution of the analyst is to describe the economic transmission mechanism that generates the results obtained. However, the CGE approach is missing some important components of the economic system. Real CGE models fail to take into account several important dimensions of the economic system. The wealth composition of the economy in terms of stocks of assets, in terms of stocks of assets, either real or financial, like bonds or money. The CGE approach is also unable to capture the role of three important macro variables, the price level, and thus inflation, the interest rate, for example, the cost of capital, and the nominal exchange rate, 
the relative value of two currencies. There is a missing link between the flow of income and the stock of wealth. The stock of wealth at the end of the period is simply the value at the beginning, WTO, plus the flow of saving during the period, ST. However, in a real CGE model, there is no money or other types of financial assets. For example, for a representative household, the only way to increase its wealth is to accumulate real assets in the forms of stocks of physical capital invested in production activities. Wealth in a Portfolio Perspective In real life, total wealth or household wealth takes the form of a portfolio of several assets. In a closed economy, the general formulation is very simple. The stock of wealth is composed of the stock money, M, the stock of bonds issued by the government, B, and the value of the physical stocks of capital in sector J. If we are about an open economy, we need to also add in net foreign assets, foreign currency, foreign bonds, etc. In our equation, MT is the stocks of money, BT is the stock bonds issued by the government, and KDJ is the stocks of physical capital in sector J. What do we want to know? Well, in the first step, we will simply introduce money as a substitute to retain real assets in our portfolio. In our definition of wealth, we simply withdraw government bonds from the portfolio. What was the situation in our traditional real CGE model? Are we talking about the price level or the relative price? In real models, we have to choose one exogenous numeraire. So one equilibrium price or a price index needs to be fixed as the numeraire and then the corresponding market equilibrium condition becomes redundant. This numeraire needs to be an equilibrium price of one market. All other equilibrium prices are relative to the numeraire. Example, they are real prices. The price level is unknown, so there is no inflation. The price of the numeraire cannot be determined endogenously because of the interrelationship within the model. That is, one equilibrium condition is a linear combination of another. This interrelationship is known as the walrus law. When n equals 1, markets are in equilibrium, and the last one is also in equilibrium. When all exogenous nominal variables are indexed, an increase in the numeraire increases all the prices proportionally, while leaving the relative or real prices and real variables unchanged. This is called the nominal homogeneity test. If you want to know more about the numeraire, read Lemelin, 2017, which has a great discussion on this. In developing a monetary or a financial CGE model, the purpose is to endogenize the numeraire that we need and to arbitrarily choose it in a real CGE. Money will become the numeraire and everything will be measured in one unit of the numeraire, for example, one dollar. The price level will be determined within the model. This means that there will be a market for money. Depending on the demand and supply, the value of this numeraire will change with respect to the value of goods. The value of money is 1 divided by price index, where an increase in the price of goods is price index, which reduces the value of the money. Inflation is simply a reduction in the value of the numeraire. So what are the consequences of using real CGE models given the weaknesses of them? Nominal rigidity is a frequent phenomenon in real life. This means that some nominal variables, such as wages or government expenditures, may not be fully indexed. All flexible markets, by nature, are neoclassical in spirit, so it's not always appropriate to analyze nominal rigidity in real models or to capture short-term phenomena like temporary price shock. That is why monetary and financial models can be used for short-run analysis in the presence of nominal rigidities. Consequently, Monetary policy matters. For example, money is not neutral in the short run. We will now consider a simple monetary model. 
We can go through the outer model very quickly, as you should be familiar with it. The outer model is a simple closed economy real CGE model without government. See DMS 2001. There are three activities slash commodities, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. There are two types of households. Sal households are those where the labor is the only source of income. And CAP, capitalist households, are those receiving only capital income. There is one firm only, designated as firm. There are two production factors, labor, LD, and capital, KD. And the value added is a Cobb-Douglas production function. So what are the other characteristics of the model? With income and expenditure of different households, SAL households get all the labor income. Capital income is divided between CAP households and firm. CAP households receive dividends from firm. A household's demand for commodities are a constant share of the consumption expenditure. On this slide, we see other characteristics. First, saving investments. Next, factors of production. And finally, the numerator can be any price. Here you can see the equations. Notice that we are using the GAMS format of writing equations. For each sector, or production activity J, we can see the link between the value added VA and total production XS. The second equation provides the link between total intermediated consumption by a sector CIJ and total production. Next is the Cobb-Douglas production function, which is a combination of capital KD and labor LD. Alpha J indicates the labor intensity in sector J. Then, the producers minimize the cost of production. The share of the wage bill in the value added is equal to the elasticity parameter of the Cobb-Douglas production function. Finally, there is the intermediate consumption of commodity, I, for each J. Here we can see the agent's income and savings. As assumed in this simple model, you can see that worker household YH, SAL, receives only labor income. Capitalist household YH, CAP, receives the lambda share of total capital income plus dividends from firm. Both types of households save SH, which is a PSI proportion of their income, and the remaining income is consumed, CTHH. Firm receives YF, the remaining share of the total capital income, its savings are what remains from its income after giving dividends to capitalist households. Here we can see the demand equation for each commodity. The first is household demand, C, I, H. The second is the demand for investment purposes, I, N, B, I. The third is the total intermediate demand. The fourth is the industry's total intermediate demand. The last is the income equals expenditure condition for industry J, also known as the zero profit condition. On this slide, we can see the equilibrium conditions. The first is for each commodity. The supply of commodity I needs to be equal to the total demand, which is the sum of household consumption, intermediate demand, and investment demand. The second is the labor market equilibrium condition. There is one equilibrium condition only so that the wage is determined here. The third is the capital market equilibrium condition. There are J equilibrium conditions. In this case, there are three equilibrium conditions so that we can determine three rental rates. The last one is the savings equals investment condition. Remember, this model is a savings-driven investment model. Notice that the equilibrium condition on goods and services applies to all three commodities. In this real model, the numerator can be any price. Leon is an endogenous variable added to the system to check if all markets are in equilibrium. It should be zero. 
Remember, instead of dropping one equilibrium condition, we keep all the conditions and add Leon. This is our famous walrus equation. Now we will introduce the quantitative theory of money in the real outta model in a very standard fashion. For example, Fisher and Friedman. M times V equals P times Q. M is the quantity of money in circulation, a stock variable. V is a parameter of velocity. P is an aggregate price index. Q is real production, a flow per period. This tells us that the total nominal value of production must be equal to the quantity of money times its velocity of circulation. What do we learn from this theory? If we assume that the supply of money, ms, is equal to the demand, md, the velocity of money, v, is constant, the real production is exogenous, then an increase in the supply of money will simply generate an increase in the price level. In terms of dynamics and growth analysis, if the rate of growth of money supply is greater than the rate of growth of the GDP, the difference will be equal to the inflation rate. We want to introduce the quantitative theory of money in the outta model, so we need to define a new set of variables. We can start with MD is money demand, MS is money supply, Z is the velocity, GDP is nominal GDP at current production prices, PIX GDP is a production price index, GDP real is the real GDP or GDP at constant prices. Now we will introduce the new equations which will be used to determine some of the new variables. The first equation is the money market equilibrium condition. Money supply equals money demand. The second equation is nominal GDP based on the value added approach. It's a choice but we can use the other definitions as well. The third equation computes the PIX GDP, the GDP deflator as an average of PVAJ, the sectional price of value added. Then we can calculate the real GDP as the ratio of the nominal GDP and the GDP deflator. Finally, we write the quantity theory of money. MD times Z equals nominal GDP. The demand for money is a linear function of nominal GDP. Let's talk about the closure now. Basically, we added one demand equation in the outta model, which is the money demand equation. Two more equations for the GDP and its deflator do not add any value, as they can be in the original outta model. So the only difference is the money market. Naturally, we can specify the supply of money. So, money supply is exogenous, fixed at its initial level. The remaining closure conditions are the same as those in the real outta model. Stock of capital of each industry is fixed. For the moment, we will assume a neoclassical closure with a fixed amount of labor supply and a flexible labor market with a wage adjustment mechanism. The dividends are fixed as well. There can be an additional equation in the model for dividends which are indexed with the price level to pass the homogeneity test. Note that instead of one of the prices being fixed as the numeraire, all the prices of goods and services are endogenous. One unit of money, for instance one dollar, is now the numeraire and the value of the goods are expressed in dollars. In other words, there is no price of a commodity fixed in the closure. That means all prices are endogenous. But the quantity of the new numeraire, which is money, is fixed. The model has an absolute price, so that we could talk about inflation. We can discuss monetary policy here. What are the options? Given the closure, the numeraire commodity is money, and the supply of this numeraire, MS, is controlled by the monetary authority and is exogenous. It becomes an instrument of monetary policy. Thus, the authority can decide to increase the amount of money, thus the value of the currency will change. Alternatively, we can fix one price of any good, 
or commodity as the numerator and make ms an endogenous variable. This closure can be considered as a situation in which the monetary authority is following an accommodative policy in targeting a fixed price through adjusting ms. Let's move on to the SAM in the collaboration procedure. Here you can see the usual SAM. It is the same as the SAM used in the real model. It should be very familiar to you. It is just the flow of one's income and another's expenditure. In addition to the usual calibrations that we use in the real OUTA model, we have some additional ones because of the new variables. In this case, you calibrate the GDP in three approaches. Remember that all calibrated variables ending with zero indicate the initial values. The first one is the value added approach. The second is the income approach. And the last one is the demand approach. We use only the first one, the value added approach. The income and expense approach we compute as indicators. They are not influencing the calibration but as indicators can help to validate the consistency of the model. The initial price value is 1, as the initial price of each commodity and production factor is 1. Then the real GDP is calibrated. After that, the initial money demand is calibrated given that the velocity of money circulation is assumed to be 2. The money circulates 2 times within a period. Finally, the money market equilibrium condition applies. We are now ready to implement our first simulation. We will consider the impact of a monetary policy in a full employment context. A full employment context means that KS, J, and LS are fixed so that the total real output is also constant. What happens if we increase the money supply by 20%? Our expectations are the following. The money market is now in disequilibrium with an excess supply of money with respect to the demand, so the value of money goes down with respect to the price of goods, and price index must increase. On this slide, we can see the simulation results. REF is for the reference or base case without any shocks. In other words, it shows the initial equilibrium data. SIM is the alternative case in which money supply is 20% larger. We also show difference in the percentage change column. As you would expect, the nominal variables, including the nominal GDP, is up by 20%, while real variables do not change. VA, J are unchanged, while P, I, and R, J all increase by 20%. Basically, money is neutral in this context. Now we change the economic conditions. Let's consider the Keynesian context. In the Keynesian context, KS, J are fixed, but there exists an excess supply of labor, LS, greater than the sum, J, LDJ, and the nominal wage is fixed. What are the consequences of a 20% increase in the money supply? The money market is again in disequilibrium with an excess supply of money with respect to the demand. Consequently, as previously the value of money was going down with respect to the price of goods, the price index increases. However, as the nominal wage is fixed, the real wage goes down. A decrease in W slash PJ creates an incentive to increase LD and creates an increase in the output. Now the results are very different as you can see. The nominal GDP increases by 20%, but the composition is very different. Before PIX GDP increased by 20%, now it has increased by only 7.6%. That means the real GDP is increased by 11.6%. How did this happen? Well, given fixed nominal wage, an increase of the money supply tends to increase price levels so that the real wage falls. This is an opportunity for production activities to increase labor hiring and increase production. We can see that in terms of VA for each sector and the most labor-intensive sectors, 
AGR and SER increase more than the manufacturing sector. All prices are up by different rates, not by an equal 20%. Because the nominal wage is fixed, the increase in the price of commodities is absorbed in the rental rates. Basically, money is not neutral. It means that changes in money supply do have real effects. Now we will consider the third simulation with a shock on the supply side. In a full employment context where KSJ is fixed, LS increases. It will create an excess supply of labor with respect to the demand. The nominal wage will adjust and create an incentive to hire more workers and increase the production in each sector. The nominal wage will adjust and create an incentive to hire more workers and increase the production in each sector. What are the consequences for the monetary policy? If the stock of money is kept constant, the increase in economic activity will create an excess demand for money and a drop in the price index. This is scenario one. On the other hand, if the monetary authority decides to implement an adaptive monetary policy with an objective of maintaining a constant price level, MS will become endogenous. This is scenario two. We can see that the real GDP increases in both scenarios, but the nominal GDP changes differently in each case. In scenario one, the nominal GDP remains the same as in the reference case. This happens because of the drop in the price level. This is the consequence of an exogenous or a fixed money supply at 475. In scenario two, the money supply adjusts to maintain a constant price level. Money supply increases from 475 to 504 so that the price level remains the same. Wages fall by a smaller amount than in scenario one. There is no difference in terms of the increase in VA in each sector. As far as the prices are concerned, the shock has different effects. All the prices are smaller in Scenario 1 than those in Scenario 2. The reason is that the money supply increases in Scenario 2. In this module, we have developed a simple monetary CGE model. We have learned the following. One, a numerator in a real CGE model is actually a monetary policy target. Two, a change in the numerator can be understood as a change in the monetary policy target. Three, the quantity theory of money makes the money in the monetary policy explicit. Four, when the money is the numerator, all commodity prices are endogenous and the model has an absolute price. Five, in the presence of nominal rigidities, the monetary policy has real effects for example, money non-neutrality. Six, when all markets are flexible, like the full employment context, money is neutral. In the next module, we will focus more on the financial intermediation. This means we will consider a simple banking system, like the central and commercial banks, deposits and loans, etc.